The NBA season is long, and every NBA player hates their coach at some point, from cursing each other out and people getting fired to strangling and hiring a hitman. Here are the worst player-coach feuds in NBA history. Shaquille O'Neal versus Pat Riley. Shaq was always a bit of a bully, but he only bullied those he didn't respect and who didn't clap back. O'Neal had disagreements with Phil Jackson, but he respected the Zen Master, and they won three championships with the Lakers. But when he got traded to Miami, O'Neal never respected his new head coach, Stan Van Gundy. Shaq would often tease Stan and refer to him as Ron Jeremy, a famous porn star. Because Stan and Shaq never clicked, and because Pat Riley wanted to coach the team again, Van Gundy's days with the Heat were numbered. With Riley on the bench, Miami won the 2006 NBA title over Dallas, and Shaq's relationship relationship with the coach was phenomenal, until Big Diesel came into the next season severely out of shape, which didn't fly with Riley. The two of them started getting into many arguments, Shaq missed a lot of games, and the heat was terrible. In the middle of the 2008 season, their beef went from bad to worse, and Big Diesel nearly punched Riley in the face during practice. In his book, Shaq said this, I started taking a couple of steps towards Pat. Udonis Haslam and Alonzo Mourning tried to stop me, and I threw them aside like rag dolls. Now, it's me and Riley face to face, jaw to jaw. I'm poking him in the chest and it's getting nasty. He's yelling f you and I'm yelling no, f you. That was the point of no return and O'Neal was soon traded to Phoenix. Latrell Sprewell versus PJ Carlissimo. The word mustard must be a trigger word for both PJ Carlissimo and Latrell Sprewell. They could be enjoying a nice family barbecue when someone says they need more mustard on their hot dog and then it happens. A flashback to 1997 when Carlissimo coached the Golden State Warriors and when Sprewell orchestrated arguably the biggest player coach scandal in NBA history. See, Latrell came to practice with heavy legs and a bad attitude. So, Coach Carlissimo told him to put some more mustard into his passes, meaning to put more energy into his play. Sprewell brushed him off a few times, but Carlissimo didn't want to let him off the hook. Eventually, Coach screamed at Sprewell that he wanted more mustard, and Spree then completely lost his mind. Latrell all of a sudden had a burst of energy and proceeded to choke out his coach. Before his teammates threw him off the coach, Latrell had his hands on Carlissimo's neck for a good 10 seconds, and to make matters worse, Sprewell went to the locker room, but then returned 10 minutes later, still wanting to hurt Carlissimo. The team tried to cover it up and act as if nothing happened, but the big blue marks on Carlissimo's neck started an investigation, after which Sprewell got suspended for 68 games. Rajon Rondo vs. Rick Carlisle with supreme basketball IQ, a big ego, and natural stubbornness, Rajon Rondo was always a handful for coaches and teammates. He only averaged 11 points with the Celtics, but Rondo was considered one of the best NBA point guards of his era, and then he injured his ACL and got traded to Dallas. Rondo was slower and not as effective, but his mouth was working better than ever. Coach Carlisle and Rajon butted heads immediately upon his arrival to Dallas, and their war of words never stopped. All season long, it was visible that Rondo hated his coach's guts and vice versa, and against Houston in the first round of the playoffs, the two ticking bombs finally exploded. Rondo got into a shouting match with Carlisle and dragged himself on the court with a big f you coach written all over his face. When he saw that Rondo played with no effort, Carlisle benched him and he never played for the Mavs again. Darren Williams versus Jerry Sloan. Jerry Sloan was an old school coach, my way or the highway, and his totalitarian style of leadership served him well when he coached old school dudes like Stockton and Malone. But in the hip hop era, Jerry Sloan's yelling turned out to be a little too much for a modern superstar, which Darren Williams definitely was by the end of 2010. Williams disliked Sloan's abrasive attitude, and the two clashed on numerous occasions until one day, their beef finally reached a breaking point. In February 2011, during a game against the Bulls, the two of them got into a loud on-court argument and had to be separated separated before punching each other in the locker room. After 23 years of coaching the Jazz, this fight got so out of hand that Sloan retired that very night after the game ended, and Williams was traded to the Nets just over two weeks later. Dwight Howard vs. Stan Van Gundy Getting drafted first overall by Orlando and the nickname Superman weren't the only things Dwight Howard shared with Shaquille O'Neal. Just like Shaq, Howard also had a feud with Stan Van Gundy. In 2007, Stan took over the magic while Dwight was already an all-star. However, under Van Gundy, Dwight blossomed and played the best basketball of his career. In 2009, they even went to the NBA Finals, but just a few seasons later, their relationship started to deteriorate. The entire magic offense already ran through Dwight, but Howard still demanded that he get the ball more. At this point, Van Gundy knew he had to do whatever it takes to please the superstar, but the lack of success in the postseason made the situation worse. And during the 2012 season, Dwight gave the Magic an ultimatum, either trade him or fire Van Gundy. If things weren't already bad enough, this internal drama became available for public consumption and the media dubbed it the Dwight Mayor. 
Then, to make the situation even more bizarre, Howard entered a press conference just moments after Van Gundy mentioned that he knew Dwight wanted to get him fired. Dwight unsuccessfully tried to make the situation less awkward by making childish jokes and hugging Van Gundy. The coach was clearly fed up with the nonsense, but because Howard was the best center in the league at the time, he had to put up with him. However, after another playoff disappointment, Van Gundy was gone and so was Dwight after the Magic had traded him to the Lakers. Allen Iverson versus Larry Brown. Allen Iverson might have been the world's most challenging player to coach. That's why he and Larry Brown share one of the greatest love-hate relationships in NBA history. Iverson was always a defiant hothead, without much respect for authority of any kind, and somebody who wanted to do things his way. Brown was another hothead, the old school kind, who didn't tolerate not being respected, and somebody who also wanted to do things his way. Iverson was a superstar, but probably the laziest superstar ever, while Brown lived by hard work, obedience, and discipline. Larry became the Sixers coach in 1997 when Iverson was in his second season. And as you can imagine, it didn't take long for them to clash. Brown hated that Iverson was always late. He hated that he partied all the time and took a bunch of ill-advised tough shots. Iverson hated that the coach was always nagging him when he gave out his all on the floor and when he was leading the NBA in scoring. But then came 2001 and their relationship actually improved significantly. Iverson bought in and finally started listening to Brown. He publicly praised Larry and said he was sorry he was sometimes behaving like a certified asshole. When Iverson won the MVP, the first thing he said was, where is my coach? To show how much Brown meant to him and contributed to Iverson winning the award. The Sixers even reached the NBA Finals. However, things wouldn't stay peachy for long. AI had a wild lifestyle, and as you probably know, he didn't really like to practice. Brown loved Iverson, but after 2003, he had enough and quit coaching the Sixers. Although they had a rocky history, AI adores Brown to this day and calls him the best coach he ever had. Spencer Haywood versus Paul Westhead. What should a coach do if his player falls asleep during practice before an NBA Finals game? That's exactly what Lakers coach Paul Westhead asked himself about Spencer Haywood, whose body needed a nap after a night of alcohol and cocaine. Coach woke Spencer up and threw him off the team. Then, in a drunken, coked-out rage, Haywood started plotting his revenge on Westhead and even called a hitman to murder his coach. Thankfully, after he slept it off, Old Spitz came to his senses and called off the hitman. But the next season, Westhead got into another dispute with Magic Johnson after the Lakers lost in the first round of the playoffs. With bad results and poor chemistry, Westhead got fired midway through the 1982 season, after which Pat Riley took over and immediately won the championship with the Lakers. Wilt Chamberlain vs. Butch Van Breedekolf it's extremely hard to coach the biggest superstar in the NBA. In 1968, when Wilt Chamberlain joined the Lakers, his coach, Butch Van Breedekoff, was in his second NBA season and had trouble coaching Wilt. The coach thought Wilt was spoiled and openly favored Baylor and West over him, while Chamberlain viewed his coach as a loser and barely tolerated him. And their bad relationship took a turn for the worse during Game 7 of the 1969 NBA Finals against Boston. There were five minutes left to play when Wilt got his fifth foul and was holding his knee in pain, and Van Breedekoff took him out to rest and not get the sixth foul and get ejected. The Lakers Lakers were trailing by seven when Wilt left the game, but cut Boston's lead to two points with a few minutes to go. Chamberlain then said to the coach that he was ready to go back in the game, to which Van Breda told him to sit his ass down and that the Lakers were doing better without him. But after the Lakers would lose the game by two points, Butch knew he was toast due to the loss and the way he treated Wilt. Van Breda resigned before he could be fired, and Chamberlain later said that he was the worst coach of his career. Players versus George Carl. What do you get when you mix a problematic superstar, a stubborn coach, and a dysfunctional franchise? In 2015, the Sacramento Kings answered this question so you don't have to. The Kings hired George Carl, a coach who was known to fight with his players, and to pair him with highly emotional DeMarcus Cousins, their fate was doomed from the start. Carl was a successful coach who was great at X's and O's, but he also had a bad temper, wasn't a great communicator, and didn't care if he got his superstars mad. Gary Payton blossomed under coach Carl in Seattle, they made the final in 1996, but Gary still hates Carl's guts. I used to want to beat his head in and kill George's ass every other f day, Peyton said. Carl butted heads everywhere he went, with Ray Allen in Milwaukee, with Kenyon Martin and Carmelo Anthony in Denver, then finally with the Marcus Cousins in Sacramento. Cousins couldn't stand Carl, and he would often curse him out, and they had more fights than Sacramento had wins. Carl even suspended Cousins for two games without pay. He tried to trade him in the offseason, after which Cousins called him a snake. After an extremely disappointing 2016 season, Carl got sacked after which he never worked in the NBA again, and Cousins only lasted half a season more before he got traded. Stephon 
Saquon Marbury versus Isaiah Thomas. Just like Allen Iverson, Marbury was the poster boy for the new wave of point guards that emerged in the late 90s. Ball dominant, tough, with a big hip hop swag and an even bigger ego. Marbury was a great player and a wild character, and it was hard to control him. After splitting with Iverson, Larry Brown tried to tame Marbury, thinking he would have the same success he had with AI, but it didn't happen. Marbury and Brown often clashed, and ultimately the Knicks fired Larry after an abysmal 2006 season. He was succeeded by Isaiah Thomas, who was a big Marbury supporter, with Isaiah trading for him a few years prior because he also served as the president of the Knicks. When he started coaching Marbury, Isaiah quickly learned why it was so hard to deal with him. Marbury often looked uninterested on the court with bad body language. He had big fights with Thomas and the Knicks sucked. So early next season, when Marbury learned that he had lost his place in the starting lineup, he was more than heated. He wanted to kill Isaiah, and there were even reports that the player and coach had exchanged punches during one plane ride, but were never confirmed. Marbury was quickly traded after the incident, and Isaiah got fired after the season ended, after which he never coached in the NBA again.